I mean, we wanted this to be a, you know, an exciting, romantic, adventurous, nostalgic spy story. I think The Last Express really has the potential to get people to see what multimedia is in a way that they haven't seen before. <laughs> well, Train of Noise is the perfect setting for a computer game because it's, uh, it's an enclosed space. It's something that you can represent the seven cars of the train you know, with great detail. And within that closed space, you can give the player great freedom to maneuver. If you want to see the way the Orient Express was at the heart of its period, when it got its name as being the cultural icon that it is, you can look at our game and say, this is a pretty good guess. It's a really intriguing storyline that lends itself to being romantic and mysterious and moody and beautiful. What we had to do is rethink the way you would make a game. because Suddenly the scale is so much larger. The Last Express is a mystery adventure that takes place on the Orient Express in 1914. Europe is on the, literally on the eve of World War I. And you play a character, Robert Kath, who has been called to the train and arrives late. Certain things have happened before you've even made it to the train that are going to affect the rest of your voyage. The characters on the train represent many of the forces that brought about World War I. You have a German industrialist, you have a British spy, you have a young Russian anarchist, you have a of the remnants of the old power of the Tsar and his young and innocent granddaughter. The story itself is the puzzle. What we wanted to do was create a seamless environment where you could, you could move from walking around to talking to people, but in a way that there was a smooth transition from the points where you're operating to the points where you're seeing yourself in, in reaction shots. The world is changing and one does need to choose sides, and sometimes things change so fast that it's hard to tell one side from the other. To me, the puzzle pieces in this game are the characters. If you don't get what's going on, you lose. You come up to a character and you can click on a character, you can give the character something. And there's also a slipperiness to the character. Sometimes you can't get to them fast enough. You know, so you actually have to follow them through the train. You can listen to what they're doing and then at that point you might want to interact with them. The thing that I think makes our game the most unique technically and definitely the biggest challenge for us all along has been what we call the character logic or creating this illusion of life that you have as you move through this 3D journey. Each character, um, and there's about 35 substantial characters, has this sort of set of routines that they go through. And basically they're going through and they're interacting with each other and there's all these sub-stories winding back and forth. But the fact that the player is there causes events to happen earlier than they would have, causes them to happen in a different sequence, or causes completely new events. It's, it's being scripted as the player plays it, you know, and I think it, take the game home and play it, you know, you're going to see things, combinations that, that we never saw here and never planned. Within this real rich story, you've got these traditional game puzzles where you have to solve things and figure out how to open magic boxes and how to discover the secret keys so that you can open up the doors along the train and how to avoid the conductor and so you can sneak in to people's compartments and climb out their window and look in on other people. The Last Express really focuses on attention to detail. The historical research that's gone into this product is phenomenal and that's translated into every frame that the player will see when they're playing this game. Because I didn't know anything about trains. Uh, nobody on the project was a train expert. So we really wanted to find an actual train car. But these train cars that they used in 1914 were made of wood. They, uh, they switched to steel-bodied cars after the war, but these teak cars, the ones that hadn't been destroyed in the course of World War I, well, most of them were destroyed during World War II. But, you know, through the network of train buffs, one of these guys in France called a friend of his in Italy who he knew was nuts about the Orient Express. He called us and told us that there was a sleeping car of the type used in the Orient Express sitting in the train yard in Athens. It had been abandoned, I guess, at that point for 50 years. It was just sitting out there off the tracks, windows were broken, but there it was, the last remaining sleeping car. That was like a very uh, important discovery for us because uh, it gave us the ability to be accurate. To me, it's like uh, bringing a period a period back to life when, um, you know, all incentive were to forget about it. Based on the state of the art of 3D modeling in 1993 when we started, there is no way that I could have imagined or anticipated that Donald could create a model that was so rich, so beautiful, and so detailed. With this particular model, we had thousands of angles. So basically, I had to create the whole thing down to the level of detail of the screw. If we could actually recreate the environment accurately and say, look, this was the Orient Express. We'd have at least made some sort of 
artistic statement. Part of the inspiration was the Art Nouveau style that was in vogue in 1914. If you look at the paintings of Toulouse-Lautrec, Alphonse Mucha, and uh, much of the poster art of the time, this was really the forerunner of the modern comic book. The Art Nouveau style at lended itself really well to this game uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's pretty much a line artwork. It's very flat. It's, it's of the time. That's the great thing about it. I mean, this is the look of the historical period that we're shooting. One of the benefits of using this animated style character is that I think people are drawn in the story more easily than if they were watching digital video. I think there's a tendency when you watch digital video actors to focus on the performance of the actors and the story gets lost. By watching these animated characters, people are more into the story, into the interactions between the characters, and you're actually more into this world. We knew that we could shoot live action people, uh, scan them into the computer, but then how to get the computer to turn the photographs into line art. Uh, that entails taking that footage converting it to uh, black and white ink drawings, basically. But then the artists go back and fill in color uh, into these ink drawings and grab the faces of the characters, uh, which is why it's called grab face. You know, we cast actors that we thought would look good when they were turned into cartoons, which is a conscious selection of physical types. You know, we looked for people with strong features, features that, you know, when they were made up and turned into cartoons, you could, you could spot them coming down the corridor a mile away. The technical challenges behind that were enormous because, you know, instead of just filming a character from one angle, you have to film that character from seven or eight angles. For instance, if you walk into the uh, restaurant car, you can see somebody sitting at a table, you know, eating or talking to somebody, and if you suddenly go to the other side of it, you'll see the other view of them. Most important thing in terms of getting the characters to actually look like they're in the train, to look like they're in the space, is to have the camera angles match. What we did was we actually took the film set and constructed this long corridor and had actors walk up and down it and kind of sat there with video compositing tools on the set and tried to match them to the rough renders that we had already coming in with us. When a character is walking towards you and meets your eyes for a moment in the corridor, you can believe, wow, he really looked at me. It's one thing to imagine all the elements in, in isolation and it's quite another thing to see them all working together. You can see the timing and the editing and and the dramatics and the soundtrack and the music build up, that to me is the most exciting thing. And then to see the special effects. As you'll see a train blowing up as it crosses the bridge, a bridge collapsing behind the train, bringing sort of Hollywood techniques into play. We were able to get an effect that I think is, uh, is really great for the player. You've got crowd scenes, you've got a dog, you've got children, fight stunts, people climbing on top of trains, people jumping off of trains. The way the characters go around and talk to each other, all this is accurate. Are you reading about Madame Caillot? I don't believe we've been introduced. The environment is very seamless and integrated, but it's all done within the context of the game and within the story, so you really believe you are there. And history is a true drama in which we're living. To the extent that you can recreate a world and bring people into it, you bring history alive in a really stunning, vivid, intense way. People play it as a game, but they also learn at the same time about a world that's vanished now um, and that we should remember. What you're seeing on the screen is something that's, that's alive inside the computer. Hopefully as, as the player gets deeper into the story and learns you know, what's going on and what all these characters are about, I hope that you'll develop an emotional response that's a little deeper and more complex than a simple question of good guys and bad guys. We tried to be very true to the spirit, not only of the train, but of, uh, of the period and of things that were happening in Europe in different spheres at the time. As much as we could find out, this is what the last journey of the Orient Express in July 1914 was like.